Welcome to uh, CKD Nephrology Lectures on NephroTube. In this lecture, we will talk about the use of erythropoietin stimulating agents in the management of anemia in chronic kidney disease. All NephroTube lectures in the form of PowerPoints are available at nephrotube.com and the videos are recorded in English and Arabic languages and uploaded on our YouTube channel, NephroTube. Below each video in the description, you will find a link for the PowerPoint of the lecture. On the Facebook group, we post daily MCQ and cases related to our webinar. You can also like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. This is the curriculum of our online webinars regarding chronic kidney disease. We discussed in the first webinar the definition, classification, and causes diagnosis of CKT. In the second webinar, we discussed pathogenesis, progression, and complications of CKD. And now we will discuss the first part of the anemia management, which is the use of erythropoietin stimulating agents. The next webinar will be the use of iron and other drugs in the management of anemia of, of chronic kidney disease. In our lectures, we mainly discuss uh, Oxford Handbook of Nephrology and Hypertension. In this lecture, we will concentrate more on the KDGO guidelines in the management of anemia, and if there is any update, we will mention it. At first, why chronic kidney disease patients need erythropoietin stimulating agents? This is because normally, if there is hypoxia in our body, this will stimulate both liver and kidneys, and mainly kidneys, to release erythropoietin hormone, which has an important role in the formation of red blood cells by the bone marrow. In chronic kidney disease patients, the release or formation of erythropoietin hormone is decreased by the diseased kidney tissues. We have to know the life span and the life cycle of red blood cells to know the importance of the use of both erythropoietin stimulating agents and the iron that we will discuss in the next lecture in the management of anemia in CKT patients. Starting from stem cells of red blood cells to the mature red blood cells, the first about two thirds of the formation or the development of red blood cells, we need erythropoietin hormone. And finally, from the formation of erythroplasts to the formation of RBCs going through reticulocytes, we need iron. That's why, as we will mention later, that before we give the patient erythropoietin, we have to give him first iron to get the benefit of erythropoietin. Because if we give erythropoietin, in iron deficient patients, the development of red blood cells will stop at this stage. It will not continue to the formation of mature red blood cells in absence of iron. Normally, erythropoietin acts by binding to what is called eporeceptors on the surface of immature red blood cells to make it more mature. And the aporeceptors are important, as we will discuss later in the pathogenesis of what is called the pure red cell aplasia. Okay, that was an introduction. Now, how to treat or how to use erythropoietin stimulating agents is a therapy in chronic kidney disease patients. We have to go two main steps. At first, we have to evaluate our patient before the use of erythropoietin stimulating therapy, then we have to start the therapy. So 
how to evaluate and why to evaluate CKD patients. Okay, what is the anemia of, of chronic kidney disease? Anemia of chronic kidney disease, as any chronic disease, must be normal, static normal chronic anemia. So the presence of other type of anemia, normal chronic macrocytic, hypochromic microcytic, may point to another cause rather than CKD on top of CKD. And the most common, as we all know, is the iron deficiency anemia in these patients, as you will mention now. So we have first, before giving the patient earth potent stimulating agents, is to address if there is a correctable, reversible cause of anemia, to correct it before giving ESA. Because giving ESA therapy in a patient with another cause of anemia will give no benefit of the ESA therapy. How to evaluate our patients? We have to do CBC, complete blood count. We have at first, for the first time, to measure absolute reticulocytic count, serum ferritin level, transferrin saturation, both of these to detect the iron level, and we will talk about them in details later in the next lecture about the use of iron in CKD patients. And finally, to measure serum B12 and folate levels. Uh, usually most of nephrologists don't do serum vitamin B12 and folate levels because they may be uh, expensive as a test in some countries, but they request these tests in cases of resistant anemia as I will mention later. Also reticulocytes, some nephrologists don't order it at first, except if there is uh, resistance for the management of anemia. But usually, an elevated level of reticulocyte, of reticulocyte indicating a blood loss or hemolysis, and you have to search for the cause and the treatment. So the main idea for these investigations before the using of ESA therapy is to detect any deficiency of these factors and treat it. Other investigations that I suggest and some textbooks and lectures suggest to be done before the use of ESA therapy is to do reticulocytic hemoglobin content and CRP for detection of infection in our patients. Okay, CRP to exclude infection. What is reticulocytic hemoglobin content? We will talk also about this later in details in the iron lecture, next lecture but it is usually used to detect iron stores in bone marrow last one to two days. And it may be of uh, benefit, great benefit, in cases when there is high ferritin level and the low T-set, the cases of functional iron deficiency, or if there is a suspicion, suspicious, uh, suspicion of infection that may raise serum ferritin level with low T-set. Uh, the, the use of reticulocytic hemoglobin content may help us to accurately detect the iron status. And the target of reticulocytic hemoglobin content is to be more than 30 picogram in our CKT patients. We'll talk uh, in details about this. But what I want to say that in uh, our patients, we have before the use of ESA therapy, to exclude mainly iron deficiency, whatever, through serum ferritin level and T-set or through reticulocytic hemoglobin content. So what is reticulocytic hemoglobin content? This is the hemoglobin in the reticulocytes, and usually it reflects how much iron was in the bone marrow a few days before. Okay. There are other factors, there are other uh, investigations can be used to detect the iron status as hypochromic red blood cells and others we will discuss later in iron lecture. Okay, so we did an evaluation for the patient before the use of ESI therapy to diagnose if there is a correctable cause. So now we will start ESA after the, after we evaluated our patients. 
is a therapy can be used in two steps first initiation of ether therapy and then maintenance okay initiation of ether therapy the main idea of initiation is to load the patient with high dose of erythropoietic stimulating agents to maintain hemoglobin at a level at a certain level then maintain the ether therapy to maintain the hemoglobin level okay to initiate we have to ask ourselves three questions the first when to initiate erythropoietic stimulating agents what is the dose and how to follow initiation regarding maintenance we have to answer also three questions the first what is the target hemoglobin level what is the dose and the frequency and finally how to follow maintenance therapy and again and again iron first you have to replete the patient with iron stores before using either therapy to get the benefit of the other medications how to plate iron what are the what are the different forms of iron to be used we will discuss in the next lecture about the use of iron in CKT patients okay starting by initiation as was mentioned in oxford and the book of nephrology and hypertension when to start to use either therapy they said that you have to consider the use of an ether therapy if hemoglobin is below than 11 but this may different uh, this may differ between different uh, centers according to the, the local protocol but in general they mentioned that kiduki kiduki guidelines mentioned that the hemoglobin target is from 11 to 12 and avoid if it is more than 13 and the UK Arena Association guideline also target is between 11 and 12. Regarding iron, I will mention the targets of iron later in next lecture. Let's let's let us concentrate on the hemoglobin target. Okay, what about KIDIGU guidelines? That was the KIDUKI and the UK Renal Association guidelines. What about KIDIGU guidelines? They said that before initiation of either, you have to take a caution if the patient has history or active malignancy or history or active stroke because as i will show now i will show you now the evidence that as a therapy may be hazardous in patients with malignancy and stroke so in these patients we may consider transfusion and i will talk after a while in details how to use the therapy in malignancy and we can we may use the same um, uh, philosophy of what i will say about is in malignancy we can use the same philosophy in a stroke patients let's bypass this part we will talk about it later but take care if the patient has active malignancy history of stroke or history of malignancy okay as we said we will bypass this part now when to initiate either therapy if the patient is on hemodialysis it was mentioned by Kidigo to start as a therapy if the patient hemoglobin is less than 10. if the patient is not on dialysis and the patient hemoglobin is more than or equal 10 don't start as a therapy and if the patient is not on dialysis and he's uh, hemoglobin is below than 10 the initiation depending according depends on the patient situation and symptoms as they said the ESA therapy must be individualized in these patients based on the rate of fall of hemoglobin if it is rapid fall or if the hemoglobin is stationary for a long time and the response of iron therapy as we would say after a while that iron therapy may be enough at first to maintain the hemoglobin level and other factors especially the presence or absence of symptoms because the presence of symptoms will make you treat the patient for a higher hemoglobin level than 10. so below than 10 it will be individualized 
And finally, whatever the patient situation on hemodialysis or not, and whatever is hemoglobin level, treat the patient, the treatment of the patient to maybe individualized even if the patient hemoglobin is more 10. That is to improve in quality of life. Some patients who are young in young age and uh, their uh, type of work needs uh, muscle, more, more muscular movement and involvement as builders or whatever, the hemoglobin level of 9, 10, 11 may be not enough, and they may need a higher hemoglobin level to treat the symptoms so they can uh, go to their work. So the final word in the management of anemia is the individualization to treat the symptoms related to anemia in these patients. So again, some patients may need to have high hemoglobin level, so individualization is, is the key word in the management uh, of anemia in CKD by using it. Okay, the second question in the treatment of anemia in the initiation is what is recommended dosage? We have different types of erythropoietin stimulating agents with different initiation doses. We have EPO alpha and beta. The recommended dose is between 80 to 120 units per kilogram, three times per week. And take care that the intravenous dosage of EPO alpha and beta must be 20 to 30 percent higher than subcutaneous dosage. So, so subcutaneous use of these medications, of these medications, uh, will be more cost effective because you will reduce the dose by about 20 to 30 percent. If you use the drug in the IV form or in the IV route, you some of the drug will be distracted in the blood, so you will need a higher dose. Regarding darbabetine alpha or other one of the other types of erythropoietin agents, usually the initiation is by 0.45 microgram per kilogram once daily. And finally, the uh, Mercera uh, in the dose of 0.6 microgram per kilogram every two weeks. The dose of uh, darbabetin and Mercera is the, the same if it is used in the subcutaneous or intravenous routes, no difference. The difference only between the intravenous and the subcutaneous dose is present in the EPO alpha and beta drugs. Which drug is better? EPO alpha beta, Darby betaine alpha, or the Mercera? Actually, at present, there is no evidence that any other brand is superior to another. So you can use any of them according to the avail availability and according to the cost benefit to the patient. Route for administration, if the patient is not in dialysis, it is logic to give the patient subcutaneous, the drug in the subcutaneous form. If the patient is on hemodialysis, so you can give him the drug subcutaneous or intravenous, intravenous especially after the dialysis session to uh, be sure of the compliance of the patient, but take care again that EPO alpha and beta intravenous dose is 20 to 30% higher than subcutaneous dose. During the initiation phase of the therapy, as was mentioned by Kidigo, you have to measure hemoglobin concentration at least once. But according to our clinical experience and according to different literature, literatures, you have to follow hemoglobin in a closer intervals than monthly. How and why? Generally, it is preferred to follow hemoglobin after two weeks of starting initiation. Initiate the erythropoietin stimulating agent for the patient and measure the hemoglobin level after two weeks. Why? The target of increasing in hemoglobin by using either therapy is one to two grams per deciliter per month. Don't elevate the hemoglobin more than two grams because it has high hazardous side effects, as we will mention later, such as stroke, such as resistant hypertension. So due to increasing, increasing of the viscosity, high dose of erythropoietin agents 
We increase the level of red blood cells, which will increase the viscosity of the blood, which may cause hazard effects as a stroke, embolism, and thromboses, or hypertension. So you have to follow hemoglobin after two weeks to be sure that hemoglobin is not rising, and to be sure also that hemoglobin is rising in a good ratio. If you measure the hemoglobin after two weeks and the hemoglobin is raised after, or if the hemoglobin increases more than one gram per deciliter, decrease the dose of either therapy by about 25% or more. If the hemoglobin concentration increases less than one gram per deciliter, repeat again, maintain the same as a therapy and repeat again hemoglobin level after two weeks. If hemoglobin doesn't increase more than one gram per deciliter, you have to increase the dose. So whatever the protocol or the approach, you have to follow up hemoglobin to avoid its rapid raise and to avoid the sub-therapeutic dose in the patients. First dose, you will uh, calculate it according to body, to body weight of the patient, but sometimes some patients may need higher doses and some patients may need a lower dose. So we initiated in the therapy. We answered the question when to initiate according to the hemoglobin level and don't forget individualization. We discussed what is the dose according to the different types of erythropoidin stimulating agents and finally how to follow initiation by measuring hemoglobin level every two weeks and adjust the ESA therapy according to the rise, the trend of the change in hemoglobin. Now about maintenance. What is the target hemoglobin, dose and frequency, how to follow maintenance? Starting about by what is the recommended target of hemoglobin level? We discussed since a while when to initiate the therapy. But now, to which hemoglobin to level we have to stop? Okay, in general, it's better to maintain our CKD patients in anemic state, slight anemic state. In general, very, according to Kidigo, the preferred hemoglobin level is below than 11.5. But again, individualization may be needed to have a higher hemoglobin level in some patients to improve quality of life. But in all adults, don't raise hemoglobin level more than 13. So individualization is the key according to the quality of life and symptoms of our patients. So why we need our patients to have hemoglobin level below 11.5. Why we don't like hemoglobin level to be more than 11.5 and even and also um, not more than 13. This is because higher hemoglobin level increases the risk of stroke, all cause cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in our patients. And this was based on some randomized control trials that suggested that hemoglobin level higher hemoglobin level is associated with excess morbidity and mortality, especially for cardiac events. The major three trials that this evidence was based on are the CREATE trial, the COIR trial, and the TREAT trial. All the trials are in CKD patients who are not on hemodialysis, but this evidence is used on all CKD patients, even in, if on hemodialysis. In short, the COIR trial compared hemoglobin level of 13.5 to 11.13, they found that cardiovascular endpoints were higher in high hemoglobin group and the quality of life, there was no difference. So higher hemoglobin level has more cardiac, cardiovascular events. In CREATE trial, regarding cardiovascular endpoints, there was no difference. There was no difference regarding quality of life it was better in higher group. From here, the evidence was based to that hemoglobin level may be individualized in some patients who have symptoms of anemia to have a higher hemoglobin level. But progression of CKD was higher in patients with higher hemoglobin level. And finally, the most important was the TREAT trial. They compared hemoglobin of 13 to nine. Regarding cardiovascular events, there was no difference except that stroke was more in high hemoglobin level 
and there was no difference in quality of life except that fatigue was less in high hemoglobin group. And regarding cancer death, it was higher in patients with high hemoglobin level, especially in patients with history of cancer. In treat trial, they used darbibitin alpha in create epotin, epotin beta and inquire epotin alpha. Here, they used darbibitin alpha versus placebo. And here, in this group, they used iron therapy beside placebo, and they used a rescue course of darbibitin for patients with hemoglobin level was dropped to too much level. But in general, as we see, that there is no benefit, even there is harm of high hemoglobin levels. The most recent trial comparing high hemoglobin to lower hemoglobin levels was published recently this year in May in CJSN. They compared a target hemoglobin of 11 to 13 versus low hemoglobin level 9 to 11. Regarding the primary outcome, the composite of starting, when the patient started him, starting uh, maintenance hemodialysis, the patient needed kidney transplantation, EGFR below or equal 6, or there is a 50% reduction in EGFR. There was no difference in any primary endpoint between high hemoglobin level and low hemoglobin level. There is no difference in CKD progression. There is no difference in any other event. So lower hemoglobin levels are preferred. What is the dosage and the frequency of administration of evacerabi? Those prescribed must maintain hemoglobin level within the target. So the dose you reach it that maintain the hemoglobin within the target you need, maintain this dose. You can change the frequency, sorry, you, yes, you can change the frequency, but not the dose of the drug. Uh, you can, come if you have um, a higher syringe, uh, syringes with higher concentrations of the drug, you can uh, reduce the frequency, give the patient the medication every two weeks instead of each week, uh, as in darbiputin, alpha, and the other medications. So you can reduce the frequency, but the dose must not be changed. You have to follow hemoglobin level in patients who are not on hemodialysis at least every three months, and in patients on hemodialysis at least monthly, and you may need to follow the hemoglobin level more frequently if there is a drop in hemoglobin level and you are following the adjustment of the drugs in these patients. Again and again, don't forget individualization in your patient according to his history and according to his symptomatology. An important point about the anemia management in cancer patients, we said that it's better to avoid uh, as a therapy in patients with history of malignancy or with active malignancy. So how to treat anemia in CKD patients who have a history of malignancy or have active malignancy. This article, they suggested, they suggested some uh, critical important points, clinical and applied points to be used in the management of anemia in CKD patients with history of malignancy or with active malignancy. First of all, they said that you have to examine the patient and start diagnostic tests to identify alternative cause of anemia beside the sorry before offering either therapy you have to identify any alternative cause of anemia other than chemotherapy or underlying chemo hematopoietic malignancy. Try to find another cause as iron deficiency to so replace the iron, vitamin B12 deficiency, give the patient vitamin B12, folic acid deficiency, give the patient folic acid, and so on. So try to find another cause if present treated. Either therapy should 
shouldn't be offered to patients with chemotherapy-associated anemia whose cancer treatment is curative. This is very important. So the, the, the more hopeful cases with curative malignancy, the more patients who we have to avoid the use of the therapy in them. ESA may be offered to patients with chemotherapy-associated anemia whose cancer treatment is not curative and whose hemoglobin is below than 10 gram per deciliter. Depending on severity of anemia and the clinical circumstances, blood transfusion is also an option and it may be the best. ESA shouldn't be offered to patients with non-chemotherapy-associated anemia. Here, if the anemia is due to chemotherapy, we mentioned that don't use either therapy if the malignancy is curative. If it is not curative, you may use either therapy, but RBC transfusion is preferred. If is a therapy not be offered to patient with non-chemotherapy, is a therapy shouldn't be offered to patient with non-chemotherapy non associated anemia. One exception, and this is very important, that is other therapy may be offered to patients with lower risk, myelodysplastic syndromes, and serum EPO level is lower than 500. This patient may get benefit of other therapy. But other types of hemopoietic malignancy, other therapy may be hazards. For patients with multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, clinicians should observe the hemo hematological response for considering ESA. ESA therapy must be considered as a last line if it will be used, and it is preferred not to be used. ESA therapy may increase the risk of thromboembolism in patients of malignancy, and this is very dangerous. The target hemoglobin level in malignancy patients who are having CKD must be the lowest. Go to the lowest hemoglobin level that may ameliorate the symptoms of anemia in these patients. And finally, iron replacement, as I said, and the blood transfusions, uh, sorry, the iron replacement is important. It may improve hemoglobin response away from the use of the therapy. So finally, don't use either therapy in malignancy patients, whatever it is chemotherapy associated or non-chemotherapy associated, especially if the malignancy is curative. You may use RBC transfusion, you may use iron. And if you use the other therapy, use it to the lowest target hemoglobin. Okay. What about is a hyporesponsiveness finally? You initiated Either you maintained as a therapy, but all of a sudden there is an as a resistance. The patient didn't respond, didn't respond to your retropotting stimulating agent. We have an initial resistance. The patient didn't respond to the initiation therapy from the start. The hemoglobin uh, doesn't uh, rise, and there is a subsequent or acquired. These patients have response to the initiation therapy and the response to the maintenance therapy and the patient reaches the target hemoglobin level but suddenly the hemoglobin started to decrease and there is no response to the maintenance dose. So initial therapy, initial is a hyper -respons responsiveness, resistance to the initiation and subsequent acquired is hyper responsiveness or resistance to the maintenance therapy. According to Oxford and the Book of Nephrology and Hypertension, is a resistance of high or hyporesponsiveness, whatever at the initiation or maintenance, diagnosed as failure to reach target hemoglobin or the need to administer above a threshold is a dose example, more than 300 international units per kilogram per week of equitine alpha or beta, or more than 1.5 microgram per kilogram per week of darp alpha. Those higher than these are considered as either resistant or hyporesponsive, or you failed to reach the hemoglobin level in this picture. Okay, 
So if you have a patient of high, either hyper-responsive, you have to assess the patient and do your investigations and treat the cause. Okay, how to assess the patient? The most important is to repeat the investigations that you need as an evaluation for the patient before the using of ESIT because they may point to a corrective cause that may be the main cause of the resistance to retroporting secreting agents. And I will add to them, you have to do occult blood in a stool, especially in all the all the patients with rapid drop in hemoglobin level. And you have to know that the main cause of as a hyperresponsiveness is iron deficiency secondary to as administration. Even if you replete the iron stores in your patient before using the ESA therapy, and then you give ESA therapy, the activity of the bone marrow will be increased, that will consume more iron, that may uh, get the patient into iron deficiency and cause ESA hyperresponsiveness. And you will find a plateau effect or even decreasing in the hemoglobin response due to functional iron deficiency. So, so the main cause of is a hyper responsiveness is iron deficiency, even if you restored the iron store of your patients. So follow up the hemo of the iron level is important and the maintenance, maintenance of iron level is important as we will discuss in the next lecture. So by these investigations, we'll exclude iron deficiency. You may, and also you will exclude vitamin B12 for lead deficiency infection, inflammation, and the blood loss by absolute reticulocytic count, uh, ferritin level, T-SAT, reticulocytic hemoglobin content, CRP, and the occult blood in stool. If these investigations didn't detect a cause of the ESA hyperresponsiveness, you have to consider all other causes and try to find them. As increased blood loss in the dialysis line and the filter in hemodialysis patients, under dialysis is a causative factor for anemia resistance, but adherence to the drug by the patient, hyperparathyroidism will cause either resistance because hyperparathyroidism will cause bone marrow fibrosis. Hypothyroidism is very common in our patients and may be misdiagnosed and is a cause of anemia and resistance to EPO. Malignancy is a cause of is a hyperresponsiveness measure serum albumin and reevaluate the nutritional status of the patient because malnutrition will cause as a hyperresponsiveness. The use of retro or the use of ACE inhibitors and the ARBs in CKD patients who are not on hemodialysis will cause anemia because they su suppress uh, the erythropoietin uh, secreting cells. And finally, in this hemolysis, we'll find high LDH and high unconjugated bilirubin. Your patient may have any other hematological disease away of chronic kidney disease. Finally, you may need bone marrow biopsy. And there is a disease which is called buretzel aplasia. You may need to diagnose according to the investigations. Regarding buretzel aplasia, what is a buretzel aplasia and how to diagnose it? In general, we have to know that EPO-alpha At first, pure cell aplasia uh, was uh, first discovered in relation to the uh, other therapy, which is called Iprex in Europe. But now, this is uh, not the case. What happened before in pure cell aplasia? Uh, EPO alpha binds to albumin in the syringe. At some time, they replaced albumin by polysorbate. When the patients injected by EPO alpha, which is bound to polysorbate, then the EPO, as we said, attached to the EPO receptor on the immature blood cells with the polysorbate. The immune system of our body detected polysorbate as a foreign body and it developed antibodies against polysorbate. The antibodies attacked polysorbate and all attacked all what is bounded to it, including red blood cells, with the destruction of red blood cells and causing pure red cell aplasia, destruction of the EPO 
receptor retrocyte precursors. Well, to uh, uh, suspect uretzel atheism, and is it uh, and pure cell aplasia. Can we find a, a new case of pure cell aplasia nowadays? Yes, very rare, but we can find it. Pure cell aplasia, as we said, the polysorbate was used in a prex, and that was the cause of the antibodies. How to diagnose pure cell aplasia? We'll find, as we, as we will discuss now, the, the main pathology will be related to the only red blood cells. There will be destruction to red blood cells by antibodies. But the platelets, white blood cells, will be normal. So you, you have to suspect pure red cell aplasia in patients with resistant anemia and with normal platelet and white cell count with low hemoglobin level, low red blood cells, and low reticulocytic count. So there is total destruction. There is aplasia, pure aplasia, of red blood cells. How to treat? You have to stop the therapy. In some cases, they use immunosuppressives. And regarding bignacy type, I mentioned it here because it was mentioned in the KDU guidelines. It can be used to treat uretzel aplasia, but it is not used nowadays. I mentioned it because it is it's still available in the last edition of KDU guidelines, but uh, the FDA published a, a, a black box warning regarding bignacetide as it causes fatal reactions and it is not used nowadays for treatment of anemia in CKT patients. Okay, what are the side effects of uh, what are the side effects of isotherapy? One of the most common side effects is influenza-like syndrome, and it responds well to anti-inflammatory drugs. And the most important in the most literature discussion is the hypertension. Hypertension occurs only in 15% of the cases, and it is more common in intravenous food. The main risk for the development of hypertension is the raising of hematocrit rapidly. To avoid hypertension in these patients, as we said, raise the hemoglobin slowly by one to two grams per deciliter per month on. Rapid raising of the hemoglobin level will cause resistant hypertension. There is a lecture available on nephrotube.com. I discuss the same topic, but from another point of view, either therapy it is friend or foo, you can uh, find this lecture on www.nephrotube.com on the section of anemia in CKD. Finally, what about blood transfusion? Can we use blood transfusion in our patients? Actually, in CKD patients, avoid when possible red cell transfusion. Why? To minimize the general risk related to blood transfusions, the general risk that we know. But the most important is the allosensitization. Our CKD patients may need transplantation at any time. So blood transfusions may increase the risk of allosensitization, may increase the PRA, panreactive antibodies on, uh, of our patients, and may decrease their chance of finding a donor. So it's better to avoid blood transfusion, especially in young patients who are fit for renal transplantation to avoid or to minimize the risk of allosensitization. But there may be benefit of red, of red cell transfusion that may outweigh the risk in these patients, as if the ESA therapy is ineffective in patients with bone marrow failure or whatever the hematological disease. If the patient, as we said, has a previous or current malignancy or a history of stroke, or if you need a rapid correction of hemoglobin, a patient with acute hemorrhage in an accident, a patient with severe anemia and hypoxia with unstable coronary artery disease, you have to rapid correct, you have to rapidly correct the hemoglobin. So you have to give the patient blood by blood transfusion. And finally, if the patient going into operative 
uh, theater and hemoglobin correction may need it to be rapid before going to the surgery. Finally, my home messages, anemia of CKD is normal chronic normocytic anemia. Exclude iron deficiency infection and other causes of anemia before starting the ASA therapy. Repeat iron stores before starting ASA therapy and we'll talk about this point in details in the future. Randomized, randomized control studies demonstrate that normalizing the hemoglobin level has poor outcomes and it is better to get a hemoglobin target between 9 to 11 or 11.5. Don't go fast. Don't target hemoglobin rise at initiation more than 1 to 2 gram per deciliter per month. As a hyporesponsiveness resistance requires a checking of iron store status, infection, and other associated causes that may lead to as a resistance. It's better to avoid blood transfusion, but there are some situations that it may be mandatory risk versus benefit. Thank you for watching this lecture. You'll find this lecture and all our webinars recorded on NephroTube YouTube channel or the PowerPoint on NephroTube.com and a link to the PowerPoint of each lecture in the description below the video on YouTube. Thank you and see you in the next lecture.